Teaching a parakeet to talk is fun. Teaching a, 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 a parakeet to talk is fun. But the old method took time. This record is specially designed to teach to teach any old parakeet to talk, any awful parakeet to talk, using a scientific method that is hard, hard to learn. Because a carefully trained voice, a scientific voice, Repeat, repeat over and over and over the same word, the same phrase, the same word. In the future, for the next few seconds, this record will be signed. Oh, hello, didn't expect to see you there. Welcome back to the What's Next trilogy. So. It's Easter, baby. I've worked moderately hard. I'm going to... I'm gonna play moderately harder. I'm going back to my family home for a, a good old rest. Might actually start my dissertation as well. I think it's in pretty soon. But before we start, I just wanna talk about my bottle for a bit. I got pretty obsessed with trying to drink two liters of water every day. To make sure I did, I bought this water bottle. It's pretty large, but it was great. It did the job. Fortunately, after a few months, the lid broke. I had to replace it and I bought this one here. Same size, same build, just a nice blue color. However, I was reckless. I tried to do a bottle flip like all those cool 12 year olds you see on, on the line. There's a seam just here and on the blue one, it just smashed open. So I got rid of the body, kept the lid and then put the lid on this one. However, with this bottle being black, when summer came around it got really hot and the water tasted grim in fact it kind of tasted like what bins smell like when they get too hot so i had to officially retire it i said i bought one of those like hip chili bottles but i still wanted to hit my two liter goal so i bought the largest one i could which was this one. It was great. It's got this handle. So I bought a carabiner and I clipped the carabiner to my bag and then I can have this strapped to my hip. Issue was for transport, it was a nightmare. It would just swing around and hit people. And that's when I entered the second phase of the bottle cinematic universe or BCU as most people will, will know it as. That is this bottle here. Slightly inconvenient that it's only 700 milliliters. Even more inconvenient is that after a few months it actually started leaking. So leak proof, my ass. I bought this one, exactly the same pros, but also the same cons because it actually started leaking after a month. So now I just got fed up. I went to Wilco, I just bought the first bottle I can find. Only problem is it's 600 milliliters, meaning it's not only the smallest out of all my bottles, but I have to fill it up four times to get two liters, which is just ridiculous and completely unprecedented in my opinion. I know this all probably sounds quite trivial. I like things to be as efficient and easy as they possibly can be. In fact, I'm trying to get as many systems as I can in place, be it my health, my wealth, my productivity. Going back to my family home, it's a good excuse to efficient up a lot of my life. And I thought I'd start with something I've wanted to do for a while. And that's involving minimalism. I am minimizing everything. I started with my hair, now moving on to my possessions. And uh, I might've got a bit carried away, brought back more stuff than I typically do for a uni break. I think minimalism and ideas brought about by this minimalism movement are really interesting and it's definitely something I want to be part of. Hello? Oh yeah, would you rather be trapped in a room with a horse that hates you? Or a frog that loves you? Uh, I think the horse would kill me, so I'm gonna go for the latter. Yeah, fair, I'm just looking for any excuse to beat up a horse. Endgame's out on Wednesday, uh, midnight screening. Do you want to marathon the other ones first? Oh. Damn, Sam, I'm actually away from Bristol this week. I'm trying to be a bit more of a minimalist at home home and I'm like decluttering. Oh, okay. Um, I'm just trying to kind of get away from that whole culture consumerist lifestyle, you know? I don't want to be too impacted by what people think of me kind of thing oh, oh okay uh wh when are you back um, probably look can i can i like call you back i'm kind of in the middle of something yeah 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 that's that's cool i get it yeah, yeah. Cool, cool cool i'll uh i'll call you back okay okay cool it's definitely something that I want to be a part of, which is why I've decided to hop on the trend of decluttering things from my life and try out the con Mary method. What Marie Kondo does is she gets you to touch your things and then hold them close to yourself and see if they spark joy. If they do spark joy, you keep them. If they don't, you put them in the in the trash. I'm quite interested to see what's gonna happen because I've never held something close and felt some kind of joy. In fact, I normally feel the the opposite of that. There's an order of how you have to declutter. The first thing you have to do is clothes. Those are all my clothes. That's too many. That's... I have the book actually. Um, I think it's underneath the pile. <laughs> first thing to do, take an object that you're pretty certain will spark joy, hold it close to your heart and then feel that joy so you know if you care about the rest of this junk. 
I can't really feel anything, but I know that I care a lot about this. It's a fig hoodie that I got from, from Tor. Christmas jumper, that's gonna stay. These have seen better days. <laughs> Oh, you know, I've been doing it wrong. I was supposed to be saying thank you once I throw things away. Thank you. Next. Thank you. Next. So I use this as a Halloween and fancy dress costume for several years. But I have recently upgraded to the banana suit. Where is the banana suit? Ah, uh, shit on it. Not only do I have a banana costume, thank you. I've got a whole wardrobe there that I didn't even empty out. Is that a golf ball? Oh, no. I dropped my water bottle. Uh... My mum very kindly found me this water bottle in our cupboards. She also reminded me of this box of t-shirts. Bungee chump top. Thank you for supporting the art. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's good. Thank you. It's just, I don't know if I'm getting really good at it or I'm just going to throw away loads of things and then regret it. Let's find out. This cat swears at people. I've worn it on a special occasion, but it's gone a bit grim. If it's box joy, keep it. That's the, that's the principle, isn't it? Oh, uh, there's so much stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Two things have stayed. Oh, yeah. Very cool. Keeping that, aren't you? This sparks joy. This is the blue jacket. It's even got a ripped pocket. Some would say it's damaged. Others would say it's an investment into a third pocket. Thank you, you're staying. I think I'm finding clothes really easy because socks don't spark me joy, Mary. I think something like films is going to be a lot more difficult. Nine bags of clothes. Next up is books and films. You're not supposed to do books and films at the same time, but I study film in English, so I treat them equally. A thousand and one movies to see before you die. I feel like every good film student has this. Thank you. Because I'm not a good, the joke was I'm not a good, not a good film student. This is a banging book. This is just all the scripts from the first series of Doctor Who, but it's not mine. It's my dad's, so that's going back to him. Oh no. Oh, that didn't look good. Okay, it might be mine now. Yikes. Oh no. Well, that's a Bible. <laughs> I'm not gonna read it. Thank you. No, it's Die Hard. Mm, breathless. I really love this film. You'll just have to believe me because I've clearly never opened the DVD. Oh, okay, now I have, so it's fine. Birdman, thank you. I actually really struggled a lot decluttering the films. I guess I have a lot of my identity wrapped up in being a film person and owning those films was connected to that somewhat. I just had to keep reminding myself that getting rid of them didn't mean I'd no longer liked the film or films, it just, they weren't desert island discs. It still felt like losing a bit of myself though, but I applied the ride or die approach and I decluttered them. In fact, after about three days, I managed to finish tackling all the miscellaneous crap and even paper. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, Mum, do I need to keep my birth certificate? It is true, it does feel a lot like decluttering mentally as well as physically. I wasn't perfect, of course. I think film gear was the one that tripped me up the most. I've probably got about 100 items of just film gear alone. Other slight issue is now I've moved my desk in front of the window, I've got this big hole, essentially, in my room, which uh, long ago used to be a work alcove and before that was a wardrobe. Too much film gear, big empty space in my room. Do you see what I'm getting at here? Room makeup! Ah! What are you doing in my room? Oh, well, everybody's heard about the bird. What's the opposite of that? <laughs> All the dogs. <laughs> Have you got the measurements? Hundred. I got them written down. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, my God. <laughs> 
outside for a bit and then actually I kind of got to do some editing work for a bit. I'm a little bit behind on editing and... <laughs> Are you really going to flip me the bird? Wow. Okay. Let's go, bros of Coney. Oh, got on the shoes. Oh no. Blackbird singing in the dead of night. Draw a penis. Take these broken wings. Yeah. Hey. All your life, you were always waiting for this moment to arrive. My new room, baby. It feels so good to have everything sorted, good looking, organized, everything in its right place. Radio, Radiohead. Cost all the uh, Cape Town money to do so, but you know, it's an investment. An investment in my future, you know? At my parents' house. Makes me wish I had this kind of cohesion through my whole life, you know? Everything from when I wake up to what I wear. Right, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, David Dobrik. What do they all have in common? Oh, they're all men? What else? They're they're uh, they're all white. What else? They're like rich, successful dickheads. No. Well, yeah, pro probably. I don't know. What I'm getting at is they all have personal uniforms. They all have this outfit. Same thing they wear every single day. I have no doubt that it somehow has contributed to their success. It's just one fewer decision to make. Right. They're not very like cool looking though, are they? They're not like hip and trendy. Well, that's where you come in. Oh. I thought 
we could design me a personal uniform. Something that has the functionality of one, but is still cool and trendy and hip. Are you down? No. My friend Sam Island could build that off, I think. Now that's nice. No, that's Daniel J. Layton's car, do we need to give it back? <laughs> No. Please. Sam, I'm not saying it. Please, can you actually just, can you please actually say it though? Right, very quickly. Thank you. Wow, you're going to get all the birds in that, mate. Right, that's incredibly derogatory <laughs> disrespectful to women. Oh, God. <laughs> Naturally good at this. Uh, I hate it. <gasps> My environment looks the part. I look the part. Time to start acting the part. Let's get productive, baby. In first year of uni, I tapped into something without even realising what. I attended all my classes. I made a 12-part film series. I passed the year. Third year, however. And the thing that's really wild is that I managed to be super productive without knowing how to be productive. I didn't even know who Thomas Frank was back then. Somehow I managed to wing it, but as I found myself reading into productivity at the start of third year, I oddly found myself falling into entropy, becoming lethargic, miserable, and worst of all, unproductive. Bottom line is, with the last few months of university coming up, I need a plan of action and I cannot mess this one up. So I've read all the books, and I've watched all the TED Talks, and I've taken all the notes, and from those notes and talks and books, I've devised a flawless flight path to endless productivity, and I call it Project Icarus. And it follows three core rules. Rule number one, routine is crucial, rituals are precious. Scheduling out what I want to achieve and when I want to achieve it by, and then time blocking each day to directly seek out that goal is crucial. Routines allow things to become habits and sets you up for autopilot. That's why I'm setting a fairly strict routine each and every day that I will follow as closely as I physically can. Rituals are routines that you worship. Where routines are mere guidelines, rituals are meaningful affirmations to be next level. They're also precious and sacred, which is why they're preserved for only the most important parts of my day. When I wake up, morning ritual. When I start work, work time ritual. When I stop work, shut down ritual. When I go to bed, bed, bedtime ritual. It may seem routines and rituals are incredibly restricting, but they're not. They are total freedom. Freedom from procrastination. 2. Burn your ships, kill the shallows. The expression burning the ships comes from the story of Hernan Cortes who, after landing his invasion force against the Aztec Empire, ordered his men to burn their ships so they wouldn't be distracted by the possibility of retreat. He eliminated flight so they had to fight. To do the work that needs to be done, I've got to remove the alternative from work. A similar description comes from the writer and nerd Cal Newport in his book Deep Work where he calls it Drown the Shallows. Things like texts, emails, just any communication from the outside world. Hi, this is Sam. I'm being too productive right now to answer the phone. Please fill out the form on my website and I'll get back to you if this call is valuable enough. I can't completely ignore emails because then how will A24 or Disney contact me about directing their next feature film? <laughs> So I've allocated one hour a day to respond to emails. All other forms of social media are completely blocked on my laptop. I downloaded some software called Cold Turkey, which essentially hacks your laptop to remove all access from websites or apps that you blacklisted. I've completely blacklisted Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Netflix, Amazon, the lot. I've also given my passwords to a friend and had them change it. If in an emergency I need them, say, I don't know, someone tries to cancel me, then I've given them full permission to act and pretend 
pretend to be like me. Basically just say whatever and then add my dude at either the beginning or end. Okay, third and final rule. This is the most important one. Three, this is your last chance. All or nothing. I've messed up before with procrastination, with poor planning, poor prioritization. As far as I'm concerned, this is my last chance to be productive and therefore successful. If I fail knowing all that I know, that's it for me. I'm I'm done. I will retire to a simple nine to five job that I don't enjoy. I will watch Netflix and eat chips. And I will give up on filmmaking. Let's get going. The first thing I have to do in the morning is turn my phone off completely so it's no longer a distraction. I take my vitamins, down at least one litre of water and make my bed. I should get downstairs as soon as possible to reschedule a tweet for the next day, otherwise I publicise a compromising statement. I follow the 20-20-20 method by Robin Sharma for my morning ritual. 20 minutes exercise, 20 minutes reflection, 20 minutes learning. I start with 20 press-ups and 20 minutes of skipping. Here I must listen to an audiobook, typically The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. Then I perform 20 minutes of meditation, followed by 20 minutes of studying, whilst I eat my breakfast of wholemeal toast, jam and black coffee, and 20 minutes of work on personal projects. I'm currently planning a YouTube series. It should be no later than 7am when I get ready for the day. I must only take ice cold showers to build discipline and self-control. Once showered, I have to update the numbers on my hand. This number is approximately the total amount of days I have left to live. Maybe people get freaked out by this when I tell them, but I'm not counting down the days. I'm making each day count, a day of value, as if every day is my last. I finish my morning ritual with these now. affirmations. I will act now, I will act now. Henceforth, I repeat these words each day until these words become as natural as my breathing and the actions that follow become as instinctive as the blinking of my eyelids. With these words, I can condition my mind to perform every action necessary for my success. I will work when failures seek rest. I will walk where failures fear to walk. I will act now for time is short. I must not delay. If I delay success, will find another and be lost to me forever. I must act now. I should act now. I will act now. As my work ritual ends, I should just have enough time to evaluate what needs to be done for the day. I sit down to delegate, prioritising my to-do list by the most difficult first and then time blocking each day individually in. Then I just have to wait for 8am to start work. My alarm cues the start of my work ritual. I make the superior peppermint tea, tidy my desk to immaculation, light my deep work candles, put on headphones, turn on rainy mood. And then, I really begin. As I'm focusing on deep work sessions, I should only step away to fill up my water bottle or fill up the toilet. At the moment, I'm writing a short film I hope to make after I graduate from university. It's an animated short about a little bird who's always striving for more, but ends up overloading and setting too high ex expectations. I have an hour break at lunch, then keep working deeply until 5pm. To conclude, I should enter my shutdown ritual. Mischief managed. From there, I'm free to do what I like for the evening. until the clock hits 10pm and I enter the nighttime ritual. I tidy my room, I put my phone into airplane mode to avoid trivial distraction and put on glasses to prevent any blue light from ruining a good night's sleep. Once my room is immaculate, I do yoga. It's tricky because of my new layout, but I refuse to fail for excuses like space limitations. I do God's work and brush my teeth. I journal my activities, my thoughts, my feelings. I must rate my day out of 10 in terms of success and in terms of happiness. I read fiction before bed to enhance my dreams and do not demand too much brain power. To get six full hours of sleep, I must be asleep by 11 p.m. Following my body's circadian rhythms, if I don't fall asleep on time, I should wait until 12.30 to get three full sleep cycles. Waking up in the middle of a cycle will leave me lagging through the following day. Sleep is crucial for me, and that is the simple Project Icarus plan. What's so nice about this routine and ritual schedule is that there are no excuses for not doing it. In fact, if you don't complete everything to the time set to the exact degree required, then the whole day is skewed off. It's like a tower of dominoes. If just one piece gets knocked, then the whole house falls down. I don't mean dominoes, I mean cards, house of cards. Shit. 
The important thing about deep work is to focus on one thing at a time and give it your full attention. Unfortunately, today I realised I still haven't edited the Cave Town tour diaries we shot last year. Also, I need to do some reading for my university degree. I'm least interested in the university reading, so that's what I gotta do first. I think reading before bed has kind of trained me to fall asleep whenever I read fiction, so I'm having to stand and walk to make sure I really focus on this. Problem is, <laughs> finding it quite difficult to do all this multitasking. It's quite taxi- It is 1.30pm, end of lunch break. I've not even had my lunch yet. <laughs> to be honest, today's been a bit- <laughs> I missed my 11 o'clock bedtime, so it's actually better for me to stay up until 12.30 and then go to sleep, so I'm gonna read. How do you do? My name is Alfred Hitchcock and I would like to tell you about my forthcoming lecture. It is about the birds and their age-long relationship with man. It is 12.30am. Fall asleep now for four and a half Originally, there were many varieties of birds on Earth. Some have become extinct. The great orc, the passenger pigeon, and the famous dodo bird have all disappeared. Actually, they didn't exactly disappear. They were simply killed off. But of course, this is nature's way. Man merely hurries the process along whenever he can be of help. No, I can't, I can't read and walk. I can't. I think I'm just gonna have to write today off, to be honest. But it's important to have time off, as important as having time on. And part of Project Icarus is to have the entire weekend scheduled off. So I've decided to have an early weekend on Wednesday. Swap Wednesday for Saturday, because I'm just all about that self-care, you know? And what I should be doing is not doing work. Training your bird can be a challenge. Birds have a tendency to fall into self-destructive behaviors such as feather plucking. When a bird starts feather plucking, it can quickly progress into a chronic and devastating problem. Many birds start to pluck out of boredom or when they aren't getting enough social interaction. However, sometimes self-sabotage is a bird cry for a darker concern. Day 10, Wednesday of the second week, had the weekend off and a bit more. I keep stressing when I don't get the days completely perfect and all the stressing is exhausting. I was just feeling very deflated by the whole thing, so I turned back to trusty Google and, uh, well, I, I found a TED talk. From Silicon Valley to Shanghai, there are people with a system that doesn't run anything like the system we talked about just a minute ago. And this system is called locking. And I want to give you this. This is a dangerous idea, okay? If you've got to make it really expensive, really painful, and massively consequential if you don't do what you know you must do. If you embrace the fact that it's more terrifying to fail than it is to succeed, you will achieve insane things. Basically, I see no other way but to go nuclear, to enter that cult, to light a fire under my ass. So, here is my updated plan. Put your little hand in mine There ain't no hill on the mountain 
Phone off, alarm clock off, vitamins, down the water, make bed. Like before, I've rescheduled the tweet, only now if I'm not in time, I'll be tweeting out my bank account details. Press ups, skipping, meditate, read whilst eating. I'm drinking Huel through a straw whilst I read so I can focus more on the book. Then onto personal work, which is now on a notepad and pen, so I'm not distracted at all by the internet. I still take ice cold showers, but I now conclude with boiling hot water. I'm tied into an app called Beeminder, which reminds me to log what habits I do and don't do. I have to confess and pay a fine of one pound, which doubles each time I fail. Today, I forgot the numbers on my hand, so I must pay that fine to an anti-charity. This is a charity I don't agree with morally or ethically. In my case, I have to donate to the Flat Earth Society. I felt like this wasn't harsh enough a forfeit, though, so I have to also commit a more physical one, too. If I slip up, I have to eat a Brussels sprout that's been left to ferment in a jar of Marmite. The goal with each of these micro habits is to get to 66 days because that's when it becomes subconscious. If I slip up, I have to start again. I will act now, I will act now, I will act now. Henceforth, I'll repeat these words each day, every day, until these words become as natural as my breathing and the actions that follow become as instinctive as the blinking of my eyelids. With these rules, I can condition my mind to perform every action necessary for my success. I will walk where failures fit to walk. I will work when failures seek rest. Success will not wait. If I delay, success will find another and be lost to me forever. If I delay, success will find another and be lost to me forever. Success will find another, it's lost to me forever. used to silence. It leaves a lot of time to think. I think that's why I was so dedicated to not leaving any breathing room in my schedules. Being unplugged, being unscheduled, being silent, it just... It's impossible to escape those thoughts. Going nuclear is so effective at both making me super productive and super miserable. I got so much of my work done yesterday that I actually had time to turn my phone on for once. And I had a voicemail. Hi, this is Sam. I'm being too productive right now to answer the phone. Please fill out the form on my website and I'll get back to you if this call is valuable enough. Hi Sam, it's uh, it's Sam. Just, uh, look, I know you're working super hard, but I've, I've not heard from you in a while. And I'm getting a tad worried now, so I just, uh... Oh, whatever, I'm just gonna come out and say it. You are overworking yourself. You're gonna burn out. It is the Easter holidays, so please just have an actual holiday. Please. Sometimes it just, it feels like you turn to work to escape what's happening around you. Even at the pub. Even when we go out to the pub, you get your laptop out and you edit. Even in spoons. We've all been worried for a while now. Maddie's even threatened to do an intervention. But the bottom line is, the others are putting their foot down and they've said that you can't come to social events again if they catch you working there. I don't know if anyone has even reached out to tell you this, but we need you to know that we're concerned. You're very hard on yourself. You set high expectations, so just... Just be kinder to yourself, be a bit more forgiving. Just this, this, this hustle thing you've got going on, this, this, this big productivity man side of you, it, if it comes back to university, I don't know if anyone's gonna stand by you any longer. You'll be left on the floor and charred. This is Sam, call me. I know why Project Icarus failed. Yes, I fell into the overwhelming world of self-help advice, considering every tip to be the one fix. I mean, if every single one of those tips worked, then self-help wouldn't be a multi-billion dollar industry, but I digress. Project Icarus really failed because I have such unforgivingly high expectations of myself, and I use those standards to escape the problems I actually need to address. It can be a toxic sphere to fall into self-improvement, but 
For me, it was a replacement for another toxic struggle, one that I'm still processing. The voicemail Sam left was right. I, I need to learn to forgive myself. I'm not, I'm not gonna tell him that, but he was right. What he doesn't know though is how I made productivity part of my identity instead of actually doing anything. How I was way too ambitious with myself and how much effort I put into avoiding actually thinking. I learned the hard way that if you fly too close to the sun, you'll get burnt out. And I lost a lot of people I'm close to over this. I'm not gonna sit here and say that I've made a serious lapse in judgment or anything, but I just hope that they can forgive me.